Thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk here. So I will be talking about the uh, greenhouse phyllosphere microbiome, uh, which is not the human gut, uh, but also plants um, are surrounded by microbes. And also here, just like, as with humans, um, these microbes have an effect on the health status of the plant. Uh, and I focus on the phyllosphere bacterial communities in greenhouses. And the phyllosphere is uh, a fancy word for the above ground parts of plants and I focus mainly on the leaves of, uh, of plants. Uh, and the second important part of um, the title is that I focus on greenhouse environments uh, and greenhouses. Well, we actually we use different cultivation systems around the world to cultivate our crops and these cultivation systems can differ a lot. Uh, and you see here on the picture on the left is a greenhouse in Belgium where I sampled some leaves. Uh, of a tomato greenhouse, and on the right is also a tomato field in California. And you see that these that it's it's managed in a different way, which much less labor and much much more extensively. Um, but you can imagine that the difference in these agricultural practices also have an influence on the plants, uh, and probably also on the microbes present living on these plants. So I focus uh, on the greenhouse phyllosphere bacterial communities of tomato and strawberry crops. Uh, and in addition, I also looked at associations with microbes that introduced beneficial organisms. And with beneficial organisms, I specifically looked at bumblebees and predatory mites. These are uh, organisms that are introduced in greenhouses on one hand for pollination, those are the bumblebees. Uh, and on the other hand, for pest control, predatory mites are released in greenhouses typically uh, to control spider mites, for example. And uh, next to these two, there are also other organisms that are frequently introduced in greenhouses to, um, to combat uh, pests or to pollinate the crops. Uh, and I focused on, uh, so I sampled two greenhouses. Uh, I abbreviated them with greenhouse S and greenhouse C. Uh, and these are different, these are research greenhouses and they were subdivided in different departments. Uh, and I sampled over the time for a course of eight weeks. So it was an observational uh, study. And the way we process the samples is quite similar to the way um, microbiome of human microbiome samples are processed. So it's DNA extraction, PCR of the 16S gene, specifically the V4 region, and then eliminomycic sequencing. Uh, and we process the, the reads with uh, true amplicum sequence variants. But then we got, uh, we, we encountered a problem. Uh, we got very low bacterial DNA reads compared to very high host plant DNA reads. Uh, and we solved this problem by using uh, peptide nucleic acid clamps or PNA clamps. So the high host plant DNA reads, um, they come from amplification and, and sequencing of chloroplasts and mitochondria. Um, that are present in the in the plant cells and that also contain the 16S gene. So using these PNA clamps, we block the amplification of this gene of the host uh, of the plant gene, um, and we get uh, more bacterial reads. And this this worked this uh, this this method to to block host plant uh, sequencing. But uh, so we got the bacteria the percentage of non bacterial reads down from 96% uh, down to 40%. So it worked. But unfortunately, the absolute number of bacterial reads remained low, uh, around a thousand samples, uh, a thousand reads per sample, uh, which is much lower than we usually get when we sample outdoor plants. So from this, we can already conclude that the bacterial abundance on these leaves of greenhouse crops was very low. And CFU counts um, confirm this. We got around 800 CFUs per gram uh, leaf, while outdoor plants usually have 10 to 100 times higher um, uh, see few counts. If we then look at uh, at the sequence results themselves, this is a PCOA plot uh, showing the the beta diversity between the samples, and we see that all the samples cluster in let's say three um, three groups, one big group here, and then uh, a smaller one here, with samples that all come from the same department, the TC2 department, the tomato uh, department. And then another cluster here with samples from different uh, departments and also different time points. And if you look at uh, the, 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 the reads uh, or the sequence, the, the taxa present in these, in all the samples, we get uh, a typical bar plot. And the 
Samples from the TC2 department are shown here, and we see that it's mostly Acinetobacter uh, dominating these samples, while we don't find this bacteria uh, back in the other samples. So that's one, um, that's what differentiated uh, these, these samples from the others. And then the, the, the other cluster that we saw, they are indicated here with the purple arrows. And these are all samples in which we found, found high abundances of Heliamella and Snotgracella, which is very remarkable because these two, um, these two bacteria, these two genera, are typically found on bumblebees and not on plants. Um, so if we then look a little bit more in detail, we looked at the, the we, we wanted to know which taxa play an important role in the phylosphere microbiome, and we looked at core taxa. These are taxa that have a high occupancy uh, and a large contribution to beta diversity in the community. And we visualize here the occupancy uh, compared to mean relative abundance of all taxa. And each dot is a taxon, and core taxa are shown in yellow. For tomato, we see again Snotgracella and Heliamella being core taxa of, um, of uh, these samples, which is yeah, remarkable because these are typical bumblebee um, genera. Uh, and for strawberry uh, samples, we see four, uh, no, five core taxa from the genera Clostridium, Terisporobacter, Pseudomonas, Yantinobacterium, and Flavobacterium. The, the first, Terisporobacter and Clostridium, they are spore formers and they were present in all three greenhouse groups, so they are quite persistent and um, they, they, they occur in, in many samples. The other three are also typically and commonly found in phylospheres, so it's less um, surprising than the Snotgracella and Heliamella from the tomato samples. Uh, because we were we, we started wondering, maybe the bumblebees introduced these taxa in greenhouses. And to confirm this, we sampled bumblebees and predatory mites um, that were ordered directly from the breeding facility. So the, 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 the arthropods that we sampled did not come in contact with the plants. Uh, but the plants that we sampled, they did come into contact with bumblebees and predatory mites from the same breeding facility. Uh, and we, we sampled these in a similar way. Uh, we sequenced uh, their contact microbiome, so the, the microbiome that was released after washing. Uh, and for bumblebees, we, we ordered three different batches. And in all three batches, we saw high abundances of Heliamella, uh, Snotgracella, and uh, Lactobacillus ai bacteria. And if we look at the overlap between these three batches, there were three ASVs that were identical that occurred in all three batches. And these were the three that I just mentioned. For predatory mites, we know much less about their microbiome. Um, in, and we saw that they was, these were more diverse than the bumblebees, but they were also very different, bet the, differing between one batch uh, and the other. One batch had high abundances of uh, Arthrobacter while the other batch had high abundances of bacteria. So it was an ASV that could not be classified um, any more uh, than uh, being bacteria. So that just shows how, how little we know actually about bacteria that are um, inhabiting these, these, uh, these arthropods. Uh, if you look at the overlap between the two batches, we see that even though their microbiome is, uh, is quite different, there are 48 ASVs that do overlap uh, between the two batches. If we then look at overlap with the phylosphere samples, we see that there is also quite some ASVs overlapping between, um, so occurring both on the tomatoes, on the strawberries, and as well on the bumblebees or on the predatory mites. And if we want to look at which taxa those are, we look again at the same bar plot that I showed earlier, but showing only the ASVs that also occur on the arthropods. And for a tomato, uh, we see again, just like we uh, could, have, could have expected, that Heliamella and Snotgracella uh, co occur in many samples. Uh, spread, uh, uh, spread in, they, they, they occur in all different um, greenhouse departments and all different time points. And the fact that they co occur also uh, suggests that, it's, that they don't um, land there randomly, but that they, they come from the same uh, source, being the bumblebee. Also important to note that it's exact the same as the exact same ASV. It's not the same genus, but it's the same uh, sequence that we found on the bumblebees and the plant samples. For strawberries, uh, we don't really see this uh, duo of Heliamella and Snotgracella. We do see uh, Pseudomonas 
Staphylococcus, and also in one department, Erwinia, being uh, overlapping with the uh, arthropods. And Irvinia is a bit more of concern because this could be a plant pathogen. Not necessarily, but it, it, it could be. Uh, and to quantify the effect that bumblebees and mites have on the phylosphere, we calculated two indices. First, the uh, dispersal index being the percentage of plants that contain arthropod associated taxa. Uh, and then the transfer index. Uh, for on the affected plants, we can calculate the transfer index as a percentage of reeds that are arthropod associated taxa. For the dispersal index, we see that the 80 to 90% of samples, plant samples, contain arthropod associated taxa. So they, these taxa are really widespread and, and almost all sample plant samples contain some of these taxa. And then on these taxa, we see that around 30% of the reeds, so it's quite high, one third of the reeds um, uh, are, made, are actually uh, arthropod associated taxa except for uh, the bumblebee strawberry uh, connection. So only 10% of uh, reeds on strawberry plants uh, were bumblebee associated reeds, while the other ones were 30% and the transfer index, uh, the dispersal index was quite uh, similar. So this could uh, mean that strawberry microbiome was more robust or less receptive for bumblebee bacteria. Uh, and to conclude some take home messages, First, we saw that the greenhouse microbiome was low in abundance, uh, low in uh, absolute abundance, uh, but also low in diversity. Uh, the bumblebees had a big impact on tomato samples, uh, and it was most visible as Stotgracella and Heliamella are core taxa. Uh, the predator mites, they harbor more typical phylosphere associated taxa. We saw Pseudomonas, Fingomonas, which are actually more typical for the phylosphere but we could not really uh, determine the impact on our samples because their batches were so different. Um, so the batch that was present in the greenhouse could have harbored a different uh, microbiome as the batches that we sampled. And then as we see that bumblebees, predatory mites, but probably also other beneficial arthropods introduce uh, bacteria in, in the greenhouse, which is, a, is, which is an environment low or poor in, in microbial diversity. We could use this uh, to, to introduce beneficial organism microbes uh, and thereby improve plant health. Uh, finally, thank you uh, for you for listening, uh, but also the whole team uh, of Sarah, Sarah Lebeer uh, and many other people, also people from the greenhouses. Um, and you can always contact me. Thank you. <laughs>